Every weekday morning across the United States, students in public schools stand and face the American flag, put their hands over their hearts, and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. The pledge is repeated at public meetings, social gatherings, and even sporting events. It is said as an oath of loyalty and respect to the flag and to the nation. Yet this pledge, only 31 words long, has been the subject of much debate. Some disagree with swearing allegiance to a flag or to a country. Others disagree with the wording of the pledge. Most of the disagreement, however, centers on the two words under God. That disagreement reveals the many differing passions and convictions of the American people. The original Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892 for a National Columbus Day school celebration. The editors and writers of a popular magazine, The Youth's Companion, were asked to write a program for public schools for the celebration. Francis Bellamy, a 35-year-old former Baptist pastor, wrote a portion of the program focused on the American flag, which included a vow or oath of loyalty. The pledge read, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It appeared in the Youth Companion magazine on September 8, 1892, and was recited by students across the country at the celebration on October 21st. Years later, in 1923, and again in 1924, at national flag conferences organized by the American Legion, the words, my flag, were changed to the flag of the United States of America. In 1942, the United States Congress officially recognized this version as the national pledge by adding it to the United States flag code. Congress also changed the original salute, known as the Bellamy salute, accompanying the pledge, as it looked very similar to the Nazi salute. It was changed to the hand over heart salute that we have today. In 1935, William Gobitis, a Jehovah's Witness, refused to say the pledge in his Minersville, Pennsylvania school. Gobitis wrote letters to his school teachers explaining his objection. He wrote, I do not salute the flag because I have promised to do the will of God. This means that I must not worship anything out of harmony with God's law. In Minersville School District versus Gobitis, Walter Gobitis, William's father, argued that the pledge requirement violated their right to worship according to their beliefs. The case was ruled in favor of Gobitis in both the district and third circuit courts. However, the United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of the school district and stated that it did not violate their religious rights. The Jehovah's Witnesses would not relent. In 1943, in West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett, the United States Supreme Court repealed their earlier decision, allowing students the right of refusal to say the pledge. The most widespread debate, however, was caused by the addition of the words under God to the pledge. In 1948, Louis Bauman, a member of the Illinois Sons of the American Revolution Society, started to lead his meetings in the pledge with the words under God included. He felt this was appropriate because of references to deity throughout U.S. history, such as in the Declaration of Independence and President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. The Knights of Columbus, a Christian organization, soon initiated a campaign to include the words in the pledge. President Dwight D. Eisenhower heard the idea in a sermon given by Reverend George Dougherty and loved the idea. The mention of God promoted freedom of religion, which contrasted with the atheistic government of the USSR and communism, which was a subject of high tension at the time. A bill was introduced the next day, which quickly passed and was signed into law on June 14, 1954, Flag Day. The pledge then became what it stands as today, reading, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But not every American was happy with this addition, and debate has continued on the inclusion of deity in the pledge. The most prominent debates have centered on the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Several atheist and secularist groups have argued that the words under God formally established the United States as a Christian nation. To date, these arguments have failed. In one ruling, the Supreme Court found that the words under God were an example of ceremonial deism, being used for ceremonial reference to U.S. history and its common reference to God and religion. Charles Russo, First Amendment scholar and university professor, described it in a similar way. Ceremonial deism, it's a recognition 
of the part that religion played in the history, founding, creation in the United States and, and should not be considered to be an establishment of religion. In 2006, then-Senator Barack Obama likewise countered the establishment argument with reason and diplomacy. Not every mention of God in the public is a breach of the wall of separation. Context matters. Now, it's doubtful that children reciting the Pledge of Allegiance are feeling pledged or brainwashed as a consequence of uh, muttering the phrase under God. I didn't. A second debate is whether the words under God are a symbol of patriotism or religious proselyting. First Amendment scholar David Hudson sees it as a civic matter and not religious, since religion and patriotism were inseparately connected in early America. He stated, Many people defended the pledge as a patriotic exercise, rather than religious proselytization. All sorts of civic groups have defended it. However, Barry Lynn, a member of the Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, stated that the original pledge in itself was a good symbol of patriotism, and that when the words under God were added, it mixed up views on patriotism and religion. One last objection to deity in the pledge involves the issue of majority versus minority rights. While pledge supporters feel the Supreme Court decisions have reflected on majority belief, many atheists feel that the case involving the pledge is not something to be decided by popular opinion and belief. They claim that because the pledge is a constitutional matter in their opinion, it is to be decided by a simple constitutional decision, which they believe is removing under God from the words. Michael Newdow, a California lawyer and atheist famous for his attempts to remove under God from the pledge, insists, The government of us all should show equal respect for all of our lawful religious views. In the year 2000, he filed a lawsuit contending that he didn't want his daughter to have to recite the pledge when the words under God were included. The lawsuit reached the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in 2002 as Elk Grove Unified School District v. Newdow. The court ruled in favor of Newdow 2-1, stating that it was a violation of the Establishment Clause and that it promoted national Christianity. The following day, the United States Senate voted 99-0 to support the pledge as written, and the House of Representatives followed with a similar vote of 416-3. In 2004, the United States Supreme Court overruled the Ninth Circuit Court decision, finding only that Newdow lacked legal custody of his daughter at the time. Many atheists felt the Supreme Court was therefore trying to avoid such cases and to minimize any objections. Newdow didn't give up easily. In 2005, he sued again, this time on behalf of three different families. The District Court Judge, Lawrence Carlton, ruled in favor of Newdow ruling that the words under God were unconstitutional. In 2010, however, the Ninth Circuit Court, to the surprise of Nunau and other atheists, ruled that the pledge was indeed constitutional. They ruled that because students are not required to recite the pledge, they are not required to proclaim belief in God. The debate continues, and diplomacy and reason have been required to judge fairly according to the best interests of the American people and the requirements of the Constitution. For now, when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, we still include the words under God. Whether that freedom continues in the future remains to be seen. To date, the dispute has been handled with diplomacy and reason on both sides, but the debate still exists today. Some believe it to be a violation of the First Amendment and unconstitutional by suggesting the existence of a supreme being, which not all people believe in. Others believe that it is a true symbol of American culture, tradition, and patriotism, by reflecting back on a figure highly respected and used in American history. This proves it to be one of the best examples of religious, or even general debate, in U.S. history. This heated debate over the Pledge of Allegiance has shown citizens what other people think is right, and what they are willing to do to stand for it.